Comic. Comics. Boneless Comics Podcast. Boneless Comics Podcast. We like Co- comics. Hi, folks. Captain Quark here. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce this year's HoverCon Intergalactic Champions. Let's give it up for newcomers. Ratchet and Clank. Hey, look. That's us. I'm Joe Getcho. And I'm Mike White. And this is We Like Comics Because They Have No Bones. The free service provided by Gadgetron Corporation. That's right. And check us out on social media at Boneless Comics Podcast on Instagram and Facebook and Boneless Comics One on Twitter. As always, Twitter is the best place to get a hold of me. And uh, we also have some other stuff going on. So We do. We have a lot of stuff going on on our YouTube channel at tinyurl slash Podcast with lots of bonus material. Our entire, well, almost entire season one is available in video episodes, maybe like half, um, but it will be available. And of course, all the episodes on season two go right up there, as well as our after shows, and as well as the premiere of Spidey Joe's One Shots. I figured I'd give a little plug for that in there as well. <laughs> But wherever you find us, whether it's at our website at bonelesscomicspodcast.wordpress.com or our main podcast site at anchor.fm slash bonelesscomicspodcast, give us a like, subscribe to us, send us comments with your thoughts on our podcast. Our numbers are increasing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's get some more feedback going. And I, I want to apologize up front. Just just some uh, like personal stuff has severely delayed this episode, so... Hopefully we're going to try and get back on track and uh, yeah, meet some of our, our goals that we set out earlier in the year from here on out. So uh, it's good to be back. Thanks everybody for being patient. I really hope that you've enjoyed just kind of hearing Joe's take on some of the sort of Spider-Man auxiliary characters in his one shots lately. I know I've actually learned some stuff, particularly about Silk from that. So that's, that's been super fun, but uh, what we're talking about today is an action-packed comic based on the best-selling Sony video game franchise, Ratchet & Clank, by TJ Fixman and Adam Archer, which was published by Wildstorm Comics in 2012. Yeah, that should be a lot of fun. It's always an interesting thing to do a review of something that you've seen and heard through multimedia and then read about them in a comic because, you know, the art is different, but the whole viewing of it and experience is so much different. I think going from video to comic print versus, you know, reading something for comics in years and then seeing it on the big screen. Like it, it seems like it's more exciting to see it on the big screen, but when you go the other way, it's just like, I don't know. Sometimes it doesn't live up to what you've experienced in the media. And I don't know if that's the writing or the platform, but we'll certainly get into it today for Ratchet and Clank. Yeah, and we can we can discuss. Obviously, a comic book is one hundred percent narrative driven, whereas a video game has a lot of those interactive elements, and a lot of times, cutscenes and story elements are there to sort of bridge the gap between big set pieces that you're playing. So it it is always, I think, kind of a unique challenge of trying to adapt something that's interactive to just a strictly narrative standpoint. So yeah, if if you guys if you guys don't know. This is, as we've mentioned, based on a video game. And uh, the first Ratchet & Clank game was released in 2002 by Insomniac Games to both critical and commercial success. If you have not heard of Insomniac before, they really became a big deal because of their Spyro the Dragon trilogy that they did on the original PlayStation. But they uh, ended up abandoning that series because Universal owned the rights to it. So they wanted to kind of make their own IP that would just be, it, it was still Sony exclusive, but it was owned solely by them without, you know, sort of a, a parent company that could control the property. So uh, yeah, it follows the adventures of a feline humanoid Lombax named Ratchet and his sidekick Clank, who is a tiny sentient Zony robot. And uh, their adventures are set in a sci-fi universe where they're forced to save the galaxies and I, I did pluralize that on purpose because they visit multiple galaxies uh, time and again from their nemesis, Dr. Nefarious. And then there, there are also other uh, sort of villains in their staple. One really interesting thing that I dug up, though, that I did not know was that apparently the creators of the game were inspired by Spaceman Spiff from the uh, old Calvin and Hobbes comic strip in the 90s. And that was kind of their inspiration 
for the the humor and the charm and and sort of the tone of this series which huh. now that i know that i can very much see that but yeah, i never would have really connected neat. those dots without having done that research so that was that was a cool little tidbit i obviously grew up reading calvin and Hobbes, so that was that was you know another like oh no wonder i like this so much right uh so i i think we're we're probably planning on maybe hitting game discussion a little bit harder in the after show but uh as far as like the main thrust of the narrative that takes place along what i think are about nine mainline entries starting on the playstation 2 in 2002 and ending in 2021 with ratchet and clank rift apart Yes. So as Mike mentioned, this is written by TJ Fixman, who is actually a pretty famous, I think now, scriptwriter for Insomniac Games. He started as a junior writer for Ratchet & Clank Future Tools of Destruction in 2007 and quickly became a senior writer for the games that came out in 2008 and 2009, Quest for Booty and A Crack in Time. These are the <laughs> titles of the games now. So... He's written the script for pretty much every game si since then, excluding the most recent game from last year, and has really been involved in the writing process pretty much as a major contributor, if not the contributor, both sort of on and off screen, as there was a 2015 film adaptation, Ratchet and Clank, made by Rainmaker Entertainment and Blockade Entertainment, although he did issue a statement prior to its release stating that he had very little to do with the film due to scheduling conflicts and creative differences. He didn't really contribute that much to it. And of course the movie ended up not doing so well. So it's probably good for his career that he did that, but he's very experienced in ratchet and clank writing. So I guess this was just sort of a foray into the comic book world to see what they could do. So we'll be talking about how we feel about that here shortly. It's interesting, though, because he just recently departed from writing the Ratchet and Clank games. And I actually have a quote from an interview with him where he said that he had written around eight Ratchet games and was starting to feel a bit antsy, not because he didn't love the universe, he still does, but because he wants to do other things as well. At the same time, he was writing features and just sold a few things to Disney, Universal, New Line, and those projects need further development. So he just really has a lot going on and decided, you know, I've done this for so long that maybe it's time to move on. So he, he loves Ratchet and Clank. He'll always do what he can to help, but he just wants to write other things as well. And as of the time of this recording, TJ Fixman is adapting the screenplay for a film based on a lone crusader in a dangerous world, the world of the 1980s classic action series, Knight Rider. Whoa. <laughs> All right, well, they need to be knocking on uh, David Hasselhoff's door, right? The Hoff is back. <laughs> well, I don't know if he's in it or not, but I, would I don't know. <laughs> he might be. He might be too old for Knight Rider now. Maybe a cameo. They've, they've got to do a, a cameo or something like that. That's crazy. Yeah. I so it it's funny because I wasn't trying to research Fixman when I looked up Adam Archer because you know, we pretty much divvy this up where you look up the writer and I look up the artist, but uh, his name kept coming up in stuff i was looking up for adam archer so it it looks like they have very much worked together before and uh that was the most interesting tidbit that i pulled out was that they didn't get a comic book writer for this they were just like oh you've been scripting the games okay fine well you're writing the comic book and it was just it seems like it was that simple so mm -hmm. it, it is cool i i think it was probably a good call that they went with somebody that was so experienced with the universe and not somebody that was just a complete newcomer to it. All right, so Adam Archer is the penciler for this, and I really had a hard time finding much at all about him online beyond just kind of like, here are the records of his personal work. He doesn't have a Wikipedia page, although he's pretty active on Twitter and Instagram, but I mean, I'm going to be honest, I, w I wasn't going to just like scroll through his Twitter feed to like try and find <laughs> personal tidbits about him. So. This is going to focus, yeah, I mean, that's, that's just the truth. So uh, this is going to focus more on like what his professional career was, but it is pretty interesting because he rides an interesting line between being a comic book artist, a children's book artist, and a toy designer, which those are kind of his three 
things that are his bread and butter. And so there was a quote by him where he said he works for Marvel, DC, and Warner Brothers, as well as developing toys during the day, while at night he writes his own creator-owned projects, which include Not Gonna Die in the Dark, Drippy Inkleton, and The Bones of Lampus Hadley, which are all, I, I guess the best way to describe them are they're like children's horror genre books. So think like R.L. Stein's Goosebumps or... Coraline or something along those lines from what I could look up online it looked like they they have a very strong horror or or just kind of creepy elements to them but they are aimed at a little bit younger audience so some of them would be in more of a graphic novel format whereas some would be just you know sort of illustrated storybook type things so it's interesting that he's not I I wouldn't consider him 100% like a full-time comic book artist. It's more like he's kind of dabbled in that world, but he he really kind of prefers to do those those sort of creator-owned projects that are, you know, the children's books and and mini horror novels and things like that. So I will say he's much more cartoony than a lot of the people that we have followed in the past. And he almost has like a kind of a caricature-like sense of, drawing bodies so the proportions are pushed a little bit outside of what would be actually realistic to make them look a little more comic or a little more I I guess just just energetic or almost humorous although looking at a lot of his work online I will say that the work in the Ratchet and Clank book itself feels a little bit restrained he seemed to be pushing the human form a little bit more and the proportions a little bit more in some of the stuff that I found online as opposed to what he did here where he actually did kind of a weird thing where Ratchet is almost a more realistic human proportion which we can get into that a little bit later but it looks a little odd but but yeah very 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 cartoony very very much in that kind of animation sensibility if you're thinking about the look of uh, like Pixar movies and things like that, you're not going to be too far off. So the mainstream stuff that he's done within the comic book industry for DC are Amakami Girls, which is uh, basically an alternate Earth where there are anime-styled female superheroes taking place of all the male superheroes that we know. So that was kind of a like an Elseworlds or just kind of its own thing. He also wrote Gotham Academy and some related spinoff miniseries and a Scribblenauts comic that was based on that video game. So he's got plenty of experience doing adaptations of other work. At Marvel, his titles include runs on Guardians of the Galaxy and Rocket Raccoon, and he did a single fill-in issue on Amazing Spider-Man. So I think we can see from that body of work that he tends to gravitate towards the stuff that lets him go a little bit more cartoony, a little bit looser. Certainly Rocket Raccoon would be something that would allow you to really play in that kind of cartoony over the top slapsticky area especially so. with a weird looking creature as your main protagonist yeah 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 for sure so you so know I, th- I think that's where he's comfortable it's funny you talk about the proportions because in the in the game that just came out well recently came out i guess uh, rift apart there's a mode that you can unlock that's like tiny head mode and so this is this is a thing that happens in the games a lot where you can unlock different modes and and cheats and things like that but what this has to do with the art style is the tiny head mode makes ratchet's head smaller than normal but it actually doesn't make it like a shrunken head it actually makes him look like he has the proportions of a real person and it looks weird yeah like his head is (laughs) supposed to be bigger you know it's kind of like a Mega Man thing where it's like he's drawn a certain way and that's the way the character is supposed to look and it's not supposed to look completely real because if you make him look completely real it looks really weird like if you've ever seen the cg renderings that people have done online of like cartoon characters and tried to make them look super realistic they look frightening (laughs) there's like homer simpson where you can see like every every stubble line and and every pore on his face and yeah it's it's horrifying (laughs) yeah so none of that in in this i i think the proportions at least were were tolerable were good it it was a good representation there wasn't anything at least that i remember seeing that was freaky looking um but certainly not not the like you know big head mode 
or or in the opposite direction of making it look just completely ridiculous? I mean, it mostly, I think almost everyone was on model to what I would expect from the games. As they started reintroducing characters from the PS3 series, I had to actually go back and look up some of them because I had forgotten a lot of what happened during that. But I think I think the robot characters, Kronk and Zephyr, look pretty consistent, if not identical, to how they did in the games. Talwin looks good. Clank looks, I, I think, the best to me. He was, like, perfectly on model. I thought he looked just right. <laughs> Something about Ratchet, though, and I, I think what it is, is that they give him muscle definition, and that just looks weird. There, there are a few panels where he's reaching towards the camera, and you can see, you know, it, it's not like big rippling muscles, but it's, it's muscle definition and a little bit more detail there than I would expect. And this is one of the few cases where I think less is more and maybe leave it in the cartoony, uh, kind of air on the side of cartoony. And I think that looks a little bit better because there were a couple of those panels where it looked weird. I also felt his expressions just didn't quite nail the way Ratchet's face looks. And I know, I know that's a really minor complaint, but having played so many of these video games, he does have a specific look where his, you know, his head is a certain size and everything. It wasn't distracting enough that it took me out of the story, but it was definitely one of those things where I noticed almost like a comic book artist sensibility coming in and just slightly influencing his design. And it was just a little bit off-putting to me. Yeah, I think it's just so hard to compare from, you know, not only animation, but video game animation, especially over the years, because his look mm -hmm. And his movements have evolved so much since 2002 that it's really hard to, you know, compare it to stills on a page. Yeah, that's true. So, but I'll I, give you that. I, I mean, I, I think it was enough that it conveyed the story and, you know, it told what was supposed to happen and it didn't take you out of it. The muscle thing I, I think is so funny because, you know, you would think that it would be more realistic for ha him to have some kind of muscles. <laughs> But it, yeah, it just ends up looking it, weird. Like oh. it would, but it just looks wrong when you see it. I don't, I don't know how to explain. It's like the the muscles they drew muscles on the robots in the Mega Man cartoon back in the day, and it was always kind of like these are robots. Like, why do they have? Yeah, they don't even need them at and all. That's yeah, like that's that makes no sense. At least Ratchet would need so, them, but so yeah, I, I, I again, it didn't ruin the story at all. It wasn't it wasn't something that really bothered me. It just it stuck out to me in a couple panels. There's one, especially early on, where he's reaching towards the camera with his wrench, and and it's sort of a close up of like the the arm is coming toward you, and it it just looked really bulked up, and it, it was it was very odd to me. So, so yeah, over overall, I think the uh, that Adam Archer has a good enough storytelling sense that he was able to communicate everything well, and and it it kept me pretty engaged throughout. So yeah, it it's definitely an entertaining story. Mm -hmm. um, so just to give you a little synopsis of the story, so you know what we're talking about here, especially because this is one that is very hard to get your hands on, either in issue or trade format, unless you you know want it as a collector's item and want to pay a whole bunch for it. But the best place to read this, if you're interested, would be somewhere like Comixology or wherever you get your digital comics would probably have this available. Uh, so this story takes place about a year after the game A Crack in Time, which was 2009 on the PS3. It includes characters from the surrounding games, as well as a few new characters that are unique to this story. So you sort of do need to have some knowledge of events outside of this to fully grasp everything that's going on but i don't think that it detracts from it to where you're just going to be completely lost it's one of those where it enhances your experience to know uh, what happens in the games mm -hmm. uh, so we start off with ratchet just doing his usual thing working on a hover car making repairs um, just you know living life as a lombax in well not luxury but uh, luxury <laughs> for him so Quark shows up, who is apparently the galactic president. He's almost like a running gag in the series where he kind of bumbles his way through the story and somehow gets the credit at the end, which, spoiler warning, it happens in this too. Yeah, he's kind of, he's kind of like a superhero, but really just a superhero in the, 
like the showboating sense and yeah. not he doesn't ever actually achieve anything but he's got excellent pr and so everyone thinks he's you know like savior of the universe so he's kind of the guy that comes in and takes credit for ratchet's victories a lot and and he's also just one of the goofiest characters in the series yes you too can be as fit and good looking as your hero captain quark well maybe not as good looking <laughs> on his watch there are planets that are being lost they're just disappearing and nobody knows where they're going so of course he turns to trusty ratchet and clank to figure out what's going on and get to the bottom of it and save the universe again so he can get credit um but ratchet has had enough he doesn't want to he's lost some things recently or people recently i should say and has decided that, you know, it's not necessarily really worth the risk at this point. And, you know, somebody will figure it out. It'll it'll work out somehow. So what happens is in a crack in time, there's a character introduced called Azimuth. So essentially what you need to know is just that he's another Lombax who shows up and he's sort of like a father figure to Ratchet, uh, someone Ratchet looks up to and respects, but isn't his actual father. But it's like, you know, since he didn't really know his parents, he hasn't seen all but, you know, a handful of people from his race. He had a lot of respect for this guy who ends up getting killed. And so now, you know, he's kind of a little gun shy because he doesn't want anything to happen to anybody else. Sure. So naturally the, story comes to them because the planet that they that Ratchet and Clank are on gets abducted next so they don't really have a choice but to intervene and spring into action so we meet our villain of the story Artemis Zog who I believe is original to this comic yeah that's my understanding as well and his motivation for being a villain is because of something that Quark did okay <laughs> makes Go sense figure. So he has huge respect for Ratchet and Clank and, and what they've done. So he sends them to Vartex Detention Facility where they are imprisoned, but they meet an Agorian named General Glam, who is from Ratchet and Clank, a crack in time as well. And they start a fight in the mess or in the yeah, in the mess hall, lunch hall, whatever it's called in, in prison. And the warden's like, you know what, you guys, we're we're gonna eject you out of the airlock great punishment so, <laughs> but this turns out to be a ruse because uh general glam is actually on their side and this is where the wily old warbots Kronk and zephyr show up to bust them out and where we really start ramping up the characters that we've seen in other games uh we have talwin apogee who's a major supporting character from tools of destruction which was the first game on PS3 in 2007. And then we have a character named Sasha Fironix from Up Your Arsenal in 2004 on the PS2. And that was one that I really didn't remember at all. Oh, that's that's funny because I was the opposite. Like, I remembered Sasha. But I, <laughs> when I saw her, I was like, oh, yeah, she's like the daughter of the galactic president or something like that. And I, I, think, I think I just replayed those PS2 games a bunch. So maybe maybe mm. that's why she that would have been the third PS2 game, I think. Up your arse. That's the one where you're like on a spaceship. And I feel like she's there in the the spaceship is kind of like your hub area, but you, she's there and you talk to her a bunch. So I recognized her, but like Talwin, I was just like, who who is she again? <laughs> that's so, funny. I think I just yeah. remember Talwin yeah. because it was more recent. I don't know. Yeah, maybe not that much more recent, I guess. 2007. Jeez. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> no, I can't believe it's been that long. Uh, so Quark has been hiding something and we get to find out that it's called the Helios Project, but he doesn't want to talk about it. But it gets to the point where he has to talk about it and they pressure him into a flashback scene where they find a shard that has interdimensional properties. And it's really funny to read this at this time because we both just got done playing the game that came out last year called Rift Apart, and it's all about interdimensional travel and actual, like, there are some shards that will take you to other dimensions and, and all this stuff, and it's sort of similar to the main plot device in this story, so that was kind of neat to read, you know, this all well, the they, I, I think they mentioned the Dimensionator device by name in this story, Do they? don't they? Yeah, I'm pretty sure huh. they bring it up in, in at least one scene. They're like, oh, the 
the Lombaxes use the Dimensionator. So it's like one of those throwaway lines. But it's, uh, yeah, apparently that was like a story MacGuffin before the game that we just played. I, I think the problem we're having is that either either there have been too many of these games and so it's all running together or there's too much time between them to where it's like, I don't remember story points from like, you know, five years ago, the last yeah. time I played a Ratchet and Clank game or whatever. Well, and that's kind of like we said at the beginning, like you can go through this and understand the story without having played any, you know, the other games. But if you do, it just enhances your understanding of what goes on and you catch those like little Easter eggs and, and throwaway lines and things like that. So yeah, for we're, sure. we're trying to point them out to you just in case you haven't played the games <laughs> at all, or maybe your memory's as foggy as ours about it because it was a while ago. But so the Helios project, there's an interdimensional shard, which basically has the power to change things from one dimension to another. And so what's supposed to happen is there's a public gathering and Artemis Zog brings Quark on board because he's a celebrity and he wants Quark to endorse him in front of everybody while they unveil Helios so that way he can be uh, he can be the galactic president. But Quark gets it in his head from what his his barber who who was the guy that like was like, I have hey. no idea who that guy was. Some, it, it it almost was like his PR manager or something. Yeah, like his manager <laughs> is in and he's like, well, you should recommend yourself for president. And Quark's like, that's a great idea. So he does that. <laughs> and of course, you know, this is where everything goes crazy because they elect Quark because, you know, he's a huge celebrity and yeah. Zog is not happy. So he starts using the shard to steal planets. And so he he shows up and he wants to have Ratchet and Clank handed over to him. Otherwise, he's going to turn off the artificial sunlight coming from his Helios device and wipe out all life on Veldon and destroy the planet, killing millions. Yeah, so that have you talked about this? Basically, what Zog was doing was he yeah, the Helios was like this artificial sun that he created, right? And he was teleporting planets to an alternate dimension with this artificial sun if i'm if i'm understanding correctly and then he was naming it after himself and saying this is the artemis galaxy was that the yeah it was like a or a pocket the dimension what he was doing with it or, yeah yeah because there was like this giant sphere as well as the interdimensional shard and i i did have a, a little trouble tracking some of that i do admit yeah 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 it reminds me, you know what it reminds me of is that um that Star Trek TNG episode Relics where they have the Dyson sphere that has like a, a heat source in the center and then everybody living on like the interior of the Dyson sphere, or at least that was the idea mm -hmm. of it. That that's sort of like what this is, except they're they're in space, but it's a it's a dimension that's sort of like cordoned off with its own sun. It's yeah, I think this sun. is like a, a miniature <laughs> miniature version of that because yeah. in the TNG episode, it was the size of... Um, yeah, it, it was like system. massively huge in that. I mean, this fits multiple planets inside, so it's, it's almost got to be pretty big. Yeah. I don't know. So essentially, Ratchet and Clank have to be handed over or a bunch of people are going to die. So Ratchet, of course, is ready to make the sacrifice, but the team is, you know, not ready to let him do that. But then if... Quark actually comes up with a plan and actually seems to be like a decent plan, which is really weird. <laughs> uh, so Ratchet and Clank do go over like they're going to turn themselves in, but they go over and they fight their way to steal the shard. And so I say that, but there's like panels and panels and panels of action and fighting in the middle. So you're not getting any of that in this synopsis. But there yeah, there's a lot, a lot of, of there is a lot of action in this story yeah and it's an action game adapted to a comic yeah. so you would expect to see some action because otherwise it would just be weird so talwin boards the ship to save them and so they make it away with the shard but she gets locked into a different part of the ship and then left behind as they escape to velden and she gets busted out by zog's uh scientist warmonger guy who's like you know what We're, i'm not really good at this warmonger stuff i'm a scientist so you know, power has really changed my boss, so I'm going to help you escape. But as they're escaping, Glam gets gun happy and blows up the ship because he thinks that's what's going to save the universe, even though they already <laughs> have the shard in their possession. And now Talwin is dead. 
But as they're mourning and planning their next steps, an escape pod crashes and out comes Talwin. She's alive. But she might not be for long because she's a hostage uh, with Zog pointing the gun who escaped with them. <laughs> so in the end, Quark actually kind of saves the day. He remembers a key piece of dialogue about negatively charged energy and connects the dots between the shard and Ratchet's Omni Wrench. And they use that to activate the shard and get everybody, like send the bad guys to another dimension and save the day. There's an awesome cameo in here by Mr. Zircon I wanted to point out. Mr. Oh Zircon my gosh, only wishes so to great. kill you. <laughs> <laughs> it was so great. Mr. Zircon only wishes for to kill you. But Zog gets sucked through a portal where he gets in to another dimension and he's stuck having a shouting match with another cameo from Emperor Percival Tachyon, Crown, Crown Prince, Prince of, of the, the Kragmites, conqueror of space and time, and in the obliteration of a few insubordinate species, ruler of the universe. Your name's Percival? <laughs> yeah, he's a he's another ratchet and clank villain that we I, I think I had really forgotten how much they branched out villain wise they really in did. these games. Because it it's kind of like they've kind of gotten to the point now where like it's just Dr. Nefarious, like he's the guy voiced by Armin Shimmerman of Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Buffy the Vampire Slayer fame. Lawrence! Um, so a couple of things happen at the end. During the course of the events, Quark tried to escape. So Clank wrapped him up in duct tape to keep him from escaping. And... <laughs> This made front page news, and the headline was Hero President Defeats Crazed Planet Thief with Arms Tied Behind Back. Great. <laughs> and so we end the story actually right where we started it. Ratchet wants to retire from adventuring. Yeah, I um well we can we can get into that the sort of his character arc in this in a minute, but I wasn't a hundred percent satisfied with them ending him in the same place that he started. Yeah. I thought that was maybe a missed opportunity, but uh, I mean, I mean, we've given a, a pretty, pretty detailed overview of the story. I'm going to say up front that like the third act that you just described where they had the big action spectacle and like Talwin was Talwin is basically ratchets love interest for uh, people that don't know. One She's of. also the same race as uh, Emperor Zog, the villain. Mm -hmm. which I didn't even realize until they made a comment about it later in the story. But uh, I guess they're both Marquesian or, or something like that. So um, it, that didn't track with me because they look very different, but I guess they're the same race. But uh, yeah, honestly, the third act, there was so much going on in so many different set pieces, which is funny to say for like a, almost like a cartoon animated type of, story that i was having a little bit of trouble tracking who was where doing what um so i don't know i i felt like the narrative got a little bit muddled at the end i think your summary of it helped me to track it better than just reading it did surprisingly yeah. and that's kind of why <laughs> i wanted to go through it not quite beat by beat but just like the main story points because the the same sort of thing happened to me where it was just like so much going on and then you sort of either forget or or you're like wait well where are we now and who's related to what and it yeah it it's funny because it almost reads to me more like it's a script or idea for a game story but because it you're really seeing does it in the comic book presentation it's just it, it's done differently than you would like a, a regular comic. I don't know. It's hard to put my finger on, but that was sort of the feeling. Well, it, it. these, the way the narrative moves, especially towards the end of the story, it, the pacing is really, really fast going from location to location and splitting up the characters and doing a lot of those kind of things. And I think in a video game, you would in between those beats where you're moving the characters around, you would have long stretches of playing the game. So right. I think that it wouldn't feel as smashed together and chaotic, oddly enough, in a game, even though you're doing all this crazy action in between, having the story split up that way, I think would have made it flow a little bit better as opposed to just like, okay, it's the third act, everything's happening at once and it's crazy. And I mean, I, I get that that's what you want to do for the climax of a story, but it, it was a little bit hard for me to track because you've got, you've got the two like 
I don't know, like old man grizzled war robots, Kronk <laughs> and Zephyr. They're doing something. Talwin is off doing something. Uh, you know, Ratchet and Clank have been split up. Clank is with Captain Quark and, or sorry, Intergalactic President Quark mm-hmm. and, and all of that. And, and it was just, yeah, it was a little bit difficult for me to, uh, finally, I just kind of was like, okay, we'll just enjoy the character interactions and just, you know, keep reading. And it's not that important because if there's anything you miss as far as why somebody's at some location, they'll kind of catch you up on it later anyway. So it yeah. was fine. I, I think a lot of these are really more about the character interactions and the the quippy dialogue and mm-hmm. fun action scenes than it really is about telling a, um, I don't know, a complicated story that's wrapped up right. in a neat little bow. You know, especially because a lot of times you do want to start the game and then you want to have some sort of resolution at the end. And a lot of times it does seem like it ends up being where it started. Like, oh, we're going to retire. We're going to kick back from adventuring a little bit. We're going to, you know, just take a break and sit in our lounge chairs, whatever. And for a for a comic, it seemed a little weird because it's like, okay, we were expecting more of a, a story arc or some character growth or, you know, something. And like if they had killed off Talwin, that could have been like a major thing that, you know, the comic did that would really be its I mean, thing but that's pretty dark, dark though yeah. <laughs> that's pretty it's pretty dark for this for this series to kill off a major character and i guess they had just killed this azimuth guy as azimuth azimuth i don't know um i i don't remember him at all so i i know that that's the explanation in the story for why ratchet wants to quit i don't think i remember anything about him Except that they showed a picture of him and I was like, oh, yeah, he looks familiar. But uh, yeah, there, there's actually like because I, I had to look a little bit of information up and there's actually quite a few Lombaxes that Ratchet encounters over the years. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, only a handful, but it's interesting because like it, it's sort of like the Superman thing where, you know, he's the last son of <laughs> Krypton and then, oh, here's another one and here's another one and here's a daughter and here's a cousin and here and it's like. Okay. They haven't they haven't gone quite as quite as ridiculous as DC has with like, oh, there's just Kryptonians coming out of every orifice all of a sudden. <laughs> like it's they're everywhere. The Phantom Zone um, is but uh, but because yeah, that does get that does get really really well, like the deeper into Superman continuity you get, the more it's like, oh look, another Kryptonian that we've never heard <laughs> of that somehow survived. It, I don't think they do it that bad with the Lombaxes, but they definitely do uh th- maybe that's like a well that they go back to one time too many i e- even the latest game does that where it's like oh he's looking for the lombaxes and then they they kind of don't do anything with it at the end which um is kind of surprising i'm almost at the point now where i'm like if that's a story beat that they want to keep hitting on they need to do something with it they need to actually resolve it one way or another like you you need to either say that they're all dead or have Ratchet eventually find them. Um, Cause I feel like that's a, it's just, it's kind of like a story beat that like maybe they go back to a little bit too often of like, Oh, he's looking for the lost members of his race. It seems like we've done that a lot. That's so. the thing though. And I, I have a lot of uh, interview notes that I actually found with TJ Fixman and I'll probably go over those in the after show. But since you brought it up, there is one that I will mention where, a lot of people think that if Ratchet meets the Lombaxes, it's going to be the end of the saga because it's like that carrot being dangled that keeps the story moving. But if you you solve that problem, will he still be Ratchet? Will he still have the same drive? A lot of his identity would need to change that it might actually dilute who he was, who he is. And make him less unique if he's not the only one right. of his race. They of course they got around that in the new game by being like, oh, this is an alternate reality version of him, you know. But yeah, that's that's interesting. I don't know. Do you buy into this? Is going to be like kind of a this is going to derail us a little bit, but I think it's related <laughs> to the comic book that we were reading because again, it's you know we're back to this kind of like oh, I lost one of the only Lombaxes I knew. I'm sad. I don't want to. I don't want to continue being the hero. That is very much the thought process behind some story decisions that were made around Spider-Man uh, as far as his marriage to MJ was that like the tension of that relationship 
the will they or won't they was more exciting than them having a stable marriage. Do you buy into that philosophy of like once the hero gets what he's looking for, his story just needs to end? Or do you think that's, <laughs> and I may be showing my hand a little bit here, or do you think that's a writerly excuse to not being able to uh, come up with good stories that branch off of that? So <clears throat> I'm going to have to try <laughs> to keep my response brief so that I don't turn this into a two hour debate about Spider-Man. Yeah, I don't. Well, I know, but I mean, it's it, it mirrors stuff that character has yeah, gone no, through. I, so I, I just thought like, ah. so not being a writer, especially not in that capacity, I can't say for certain. But just from my perspective, it really seems like. We just don't know how to write things without some sort of major character, I don't know, issue that we dangle out in front that keeps them moving. Because mm -hmm. why can't Peter Parker and Mary Jane be married and yet still have Spider-Man do his thing? Why does that need to change him in a way that he doesn't need to be Spider-Man? Like, there, there's so many things that that happen in media where it's like, like Gilmore girls is a prime example where it's like the, will they, won't they? And then they do, but then it doesn't work out. So then <laughs> they, they go to somebody else and then that seems great. And, Oh, actually there's a fundamental flaw and then that doesn't work out. And it's like the whole series premise is that things don't work out and nothing lasts because if it does, then the show's over because then they, yeah, have there's, peace no, there's, and there's no, there's no conflict, conflict. <laughs> but I, I think this is very important in Star Trek where it's like the whole idea is we're in the future and humanity is so much better than it was that we've evolved to the point where we don't need to be driven by money. Greed is gone, but then it gets hard to tell modern stories. So then we have to find ways to introduce those things back in. So now we have Latinum and we have credits and we have, you know, all these primitive races out there that are, you know, causing us to basically do the same thing that they're doing, which is the same thing that humanity used to do that we said that we evolved from. <laughs> so it, it's really easy just to point the finger and be like, oh, it's just, you know, poor st storytelling. They can't come up with a good enough reason. But I've never sat down with a blank page and tried to write something like that. So I'm imagining that it's probably very challenging. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's fair. I think that's fair to say. I, I personally think that six issues of a comic book and nine mainline story entries later maybe it's time to try and move his character along a little bit but i also think that within a video game framework that may not be as necessary because as long as you're delivering a satisfying experience to play that really is going to be that that's going to be the part that's going to get the most critiquing yeah, um, I think change from a, from a yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I, I think change is a very good way to sort of get around that is to where you sort of exchange one conflict to another. I think a mm -hmm. good example is Doctor Who, which is so long running. Just I mean, way more than Ratchet and Clank, but the same idea of when you have something going on for so long, how do you keep it fresh and also keep it moving without rehashing the same things over and over because like Gilmore sure. Girls was only six seasons, but by the sixth season, I'm just like, okay, like, geez, guys, get your crap together. You make the same, yeah, they're out of gas. From the same issues and you didn't learn your lessons and it just kind of gets annoying at the end. But like with, with Dr. Who, he has all this, these points of contention because he's sort of the rebel character uh, mm -hmm. with his, his species. And so he sort of goes back and forth with them and then they do this radical shift where essentially he has to win a war by freezing everybody involved in that war in time and sort of hiding them away to where they're, they're deadlocked essentially forever. And so now he's the last of his race. And, you know, we go through the emotional trauma that that brings and how he blames himself. And, you know, we do that for a number of years. And then we find a way to sort of rescue them and, and deal with that issue but then, you know, it, it's just like it it morphs and it changes. It goes from one thing to another. So Ratchet could very well find the Lombax planet and maybe we dangle the carrot in a different way as of like maybe he's transported there and he gets to meet everybody and get some sort of re re resolution. But 
maybe he's whisked back and he doesn't know where they are. And so he's like, okay, now I know they're out there and I know that they're looking for me and I know all this stuff. I just have to locate them because now they're, they're stuck in time or they're stuck in another dimension or they're stuck, you know, somewhere That's else. That's actually what, yeah, I, that's actually exactly what I was thinking was that I, I feel like you could you could have that moment where you give him some sense of resolution and have him actually find them. But then maybe the dimensional portal is destabilized or something happens and he's not able to remain there for whatever reason. Or maybe you even give him again, this is good for character. Maybe you give him a, a moment where he has to choose between his life that he's known or staying with them. Right there or there's there's even there's even like a dark version of that maybe where he finds them and they're not good people or they're like warlike or something and he has to turn his back on his own race or something like that. I mean, they there I, I feel like there are many directions that they could splinter that off if they decide to actually make that decision to have him finally find them. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, it, it just it struck me in this story because. I felt like the idea of him uh, wanting to retire and quit and just go back to being a mechanic, that was kind of a story beat that I'd seen repeated in the games a lot. Mm -hmm. And then also, yeah, that sort of like quest to find his people, that thing, it just feels like it never gets resolved and they keep bringing it up. So that's really interesting, though, hearing that the writer himself was kind of like, I don't know if we should ever answer that question. So... Uh, and we we kind of got off track, but I I think it was good maybe to to like sort of awkwardly segue <laughs> us back into discussing this story. So one of the things that's really a hallmark of this series are jokes and humor, and and just kind of having a even even when there's like crazy sci-fi action set pieces going on, there's usually a lot of comedy in the middle of that. Do you think that this story handled that well? Do you think they nailed it? Do you think they didn't? I think there's a lot of things, and and maybe it's not fair to cram, you know, 10 years of video games into one or, well, six issues of comics. Right. But, you know, there were a lot of things that, that feel like they're staples of the series that were sort of missing. Like, there, there was some humor, but it wasn't... I would agree with that as creative like ratchet and clank really has a lot of creative humor that's more than just the sort of one line one liners or quips i mean those are definitely present the weapon used to vaporize the cragmites was a hat oh come on there's no way a lombax would invent something that ridiculous oh really what about your nuclear powered rocket sled your anti-matter bathroom buddy and let us not forget about the electroshock undergarments you invented last fall. Stunderwear. Huge seller on Umbris. Yeah, um, uh, that, that was a big, that's going to be a big miss for me uh, as far as this story goes. The humor was just not there that I would expect from this series. And I felt like they played it, for the most part, really straight. I think Emperor Zog got most of the comedic moments in just in his sort of like, menacing over the top supervillain portrayal he's also kind of like a chubby guy wearing a long robe <laughs> that we're supposed to be scared by so uh you know i mean i mean he just kind of looks comedic as well but i uh ratchet in particular i felt like his quips just were not on the same level and i don't know if that's because they have like a team of writers on the games or you know what the what the difference was because tj fixman is the writer for the games right so i don't know why but it just tonally it felt like they were going a little bit more serious with it and that that oddly was a change that i didn't particularly enjoy so yeah and that that's sort of the thing with this is like it it's a little awkward i think in the middle of being a comic book adaptation being like being an actual comic book versus being what we're used to seeing in the video games like it, it's missing certain things like i said that are are prevalent in each game that carry through but it's also missing things that i think make a really good comic story so it's like wh where does it fall from there yeah so uh an another thing and this is this is probably skipping ahead a little bit but another thing that i noticed that is really a hallmark of the games that was missing and this, this is something that they nailed in the Mega Man comic, but that I felt was really missing here, 
was the games rely on Ratchet having insanely bizarre weaponry. <laughs> and I mean, insanely like... Insanely bizarre. Yeah, like, you're turning your enemies into topiaries. You're, uh, you know, you're sending the, the little robots out that insult people. I was glad that that was in there. The Sheepinator, which turns enemies into sheep. I mean, you, you have all these... It's, it's always been sort of like they're making a third-person shooter platformer, but they're also kind of making fun of the genre at the same time, even with the way the game plays. And really, every time we have an action set piece in this comic, Ratchet is just using like a basic, a, a phaser, basically, mm -hmm. from like Star Trek, the original series, just like a blaster or, you know, some kind of like rapid fire thing. He does get his Omni Wrench, like dual Omni Wrench staff, towards the end of it that's charged up with energy but even then that's really restrained for ratchet and clank like you're you're used to seeing stuff that is just way over the top for his arsenal and they really didn't do any of that which which to me was a really big miss too because i thought like like yeah it's going to be really fun to see this artist's take on you know oh he's blowing away a room full of robots but he's turning them all into sheep or you know whatever yeah, and how do you use those strategically? Because in the game, you can kind of just switch to whatever weapon you want at any time or whatever has ammo. But in a comic, like, it, it has to make sense, you know, because it's fixed within the story. I think that's another, you know, that puts this sort of in that awkward space between game and, and comic where it's like, you know, if this was just a comic story and they wanted to focus on the story elements, I could say, oh, I was sad not to see any of the cool guns, but, you know, it was really a story that they wanted to tell, so I get it. But there's, a, like, a ton of action sequences. Yeah, so there really the world, are. I mean, I guess they couldn't explain why he would have these weapons or maybe he didn't have time to acquire them. Well, they, know, but... they could. They could because um, there, there's one throwaway line where... Uh, they talk about Clank is like, whoa, Emperor Zog has Mr. Zircon robots. And Ratchet says something about like, oh, well, Grummelnet will wholesale Mr. Zircons to anybody that has the bolts, basically. Wow. And so they did they did have one line in there that explained that like apparently the same vendor that Ratchet shops at for all his gadgets and weapons, like the the evil emperor can also shop there. So I thought that was enough to justify them throwing in some of that crazy stuff. Again, it was just like one line, but I feel like that was enough to be like, oh, yeah, so anybody can go. They're arms dealers, basically. Right. You know, anybody can go if they've got the bolts, they can, uh, you know, they can get a sheepinator or, or a vacuum suck or wh whatever the <laughs> crazy weapon is. So. so speaking of Zog, what did you think of him as a villain? Um, I think he was fine. I mean, he he was entertaining. He was over the top. He, most of the humor in the story, I feel like came from him sort of abusing his, uh, assistant I Igor. It's not Igor, but he's basically <laughs> Igor. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to call him Igor. Cause I don't remember his name, but, but, uh, yeah, there was a lot of that. And, you know, just sort of the maniacal over the top super villain laughing character. I mean, he was kind of stock, but I think he served the the story just fine. Uh, the the one thing that I questioned about him was, so he was supposedly this good galactic ruler, right? That was sort of benevolent, and the people loved him, and he was going to get reelected. And then Quark betrays him and decides to run for president and beats him. And that was enough to make Emperor Zog go so dark that he's going to threaten millions of lives on planet Belden and like cut off their sunlight and teleport all these planets to another dimension. Like that seems like too much of a turn yeah. based on what they tell us about him beforehand. So I, I felt like his, his sort of, it, it was almost like the revenge of the Sith where Anakin, it's just like, there's a scene where you just like flip a switch and he's like, well, I'm evil now. And, and that's, basically it yeah. you know it it's it, it kind of felt like that where they didn't really justify it with character in the story and maybe i mean am i not being fair because this is like a cartoon thing i i don't know but but i mean it's yeah i i feel like that needs to work for the the rest of the story to work so i felt like that was kind of a problem well, i think that main conflict between hero and villain is 
super important because if you don't get that right, then, you know, everything else in the story just doesn't seem like it, it falls apart more. I right. I think if they would have shown Emperor Zog as an evil character who was playing nice and wanted to be president so that he could, you know, be an overlord, overlord and take over the galaxy, but then he's going to take it into his own hands since he didn't get the position, you know, that, that would have maybe made more sense. But yeah, like at the beginning, he seems like he's developing this Helios thing to better the universe and he wants to be president and share this with everybody and it's going to be a good thing. And then Quark portrays him and I mean, Quark, sucks like don't get me wrong but to right, go yeah, on this, he does <laughs> to go on this rampage because of it and then in the heat of the conflict he want he demands that they send over ratchet and clank or he's gonna you know kill millions like well, why doesn't he want quark why doesn't he want to you know roast quark and then or be like you need to publicly admit that you betrayed me and stole you know whatever from me and step down and then right. I'll take over, you know, not nothing like, like he didn't seem interested in that at all. So it, no. it seemed like he wasn't, I don't know. Like, well, I think Quark brings it up too. Cause there's a scene where Quark is like, you, I'm the one you want, you know, let them go in like kind of an uncharacteristically mm -hmm. selfless. Like I think it was only like one line and it was while he was all bound up by duct tape and couldn't move. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think he even brings it up and it's just like, it, it, there's this weird thing where like Emperor Zog respects ratchet and clank because they've saved the universe yeah but also he's like i'm gonna kill everybody on your planet because i'm evil i don't know to be, what was it to like set an example and prove to the universe that he's serious something or that they like need that to, i mean uh, he has kind of the standard supervillain speech about like oh the universe is chaos and we need to unite under one banner or you know and and have order <laughs> actually might be a good segue into our uh our star trek episode next time <laughs> talking about chaos and order that's definitely something that we get into with the borg a lot but uh yeah yeah i don't know his character turn just didn't feel justified within the story so yeah, yeah i don't know but i i mean as if if i'm just looking at him like on the surface level as a character like he was entertaining i mean and and honestly i was glad that they didn't use dr nefarious oh yeah be because i do think that they he he's a really good performance it's kind of like whenever jeffrey combs shows up on star trek you're like all right we're we're gonna get something <laughs> entertaining now you know and so with armin shimmerman voicing dr nefarious i think they keep bringing him back just because like the performance is so entertaining that yeah. it kind of makes up for the fact that you're just seeing this guy over and over but but i i do enjoy uh tj fixman at least trying to do something different here so well and inventing a, a totally new villain for this story instead of rehashing yeah. anything really yeah agreed so but but at the same time keeping characters that we're familiar with so that way we're more invested in seeing them win because if it was like we're going to tell a completely different story and ratchet's just going to have a cameo it might be a little harder to be on board with it if it were something well, like that it'd be hard to sell it too yeah, I exactly. Think. So speaking of selling it, Captain Quark in this, I felt like <laughs> they they went from nailing his character to trying to break new ground on his character that I just wasn't on board with. Yeah, I didn't I didn't buy it at all. I'm I'm hundred percent with you. Yeah. There. So like like that scene that you mentioned with him, you know, basically I'm the one that you want and and him being the one that figured out that they were after or that the uh, Omni Wrench had the same type of energy that was required to activate the shard, and just all these things like him remembering some key important thing and connecting dots, like him blurting out something completely random, and somebody using that to be like, actually, yeah, that'll work. That that's yeah. fine. But for him actually to say, use the wrench, you know, that that's. Yeah, that's that hard. would be much more in character, or for him to like, you know, stumble into the room and break something crucial to the villain's plan it's it's sort of like the darkwing duck thing of like <laughs> like he he's not actually amazingly competent but he seems to like bumble his way to success and i feel that's sort of how i view captain quark like if he was going to help our heroes it would have been by accident 
Right. Like. He would have knocked something over that went into the wrench and knocked it into the shard, and then it had a reaction like, whoa, and he's like, huh, and he doesn't even notice what happened. And it would, it would have been another opportunity for, like, another comedic beat, which I, I think we've mentioned this story was a little bit light on. I'm starting to think there may not even be an intergalactic tool of justice award. Ladies and gentlemen, your president. I think that would be the only weapon then that appeared in this game was the vacuum suck, and they used it to suck all the humor out. And you, Ratchet, <laughs> you suck. Huh? What? <laughs> oh, man. That's a, that's a harsh... <laughs> Cannon. That's a harsh analysis. Yeah, so I, I think we I think we've kind of covered most of what I wanted to talk about. I I think that it is a strength of the comic book that it does its best to include a lot of characters from the series, but I also think that might be its greatest weakness because it is a little bit of a barrier if you're trying to just come in and read this cold. And it, obviously that's probably not their you know, their, their main audience, they're probably banking on like, oh, these are successful video games. We want to get that, get that dollar on, you know, our publishing division at Wildstorm. But so I'm going to give this a three and it's, it's a strong three. The reason it's not like a four is because I do feel like there were just too many core elements of the series missing that really would have punched this up another number. So if you if you put in more of the humor, if you um if you put in more of the crazy gadgets and and stuff like that, I mean that's you're not showing up to Ratchet and Clank to see him just use like a gun, basically, which is is pretty much what he what what he uses in most of the big action set pieces in this. I think there were just too many of those sort of core series elements missing the art had a couple places where you know it wasn't my favorite overall i thought that that adam archer did a really really good job of keeping everybody on model i think the covers actually were phenomenal the covers were like like they nailed the aesthetic of the game i don't know if archer didn't do those or if that was somebody else but yeah overall this is it's one of those where if you're a really big fan of ratchet and clank i would say probably hunt it down on comiXology give it a shot and read it but if you're not already invested in this series i don't think this is something that's going to win you over and i also don't know that it's the best representation of what this series is or what it can be as a whole so three out of five this one is really really hard for me to rate because <laughs> uh, of what you just mentioned but also like this isn't something that I would really recommend to to anybody. Like, hey, if you've never heard of Ratchet and Clank, <laughs> I would be like, well, you should play one of the games or look up a couple right. videos on YouTube. I wouldn't be like, hey, read this, you know, one-off comic book. And I I really feel like what we got here is sort of a watered down game premise told in a comic book format. I don't think we actually got a comic series that was you know, what we're used to seeing in comics. And maybe that's because we had sort of a, a media writer writing a comic book. And so it was a good script, but the actual execution of it and, you know, missing things from the game is one thing, but we also, you know, again, didn't really get a character arc whatsoever. Nothing yeah. really changed or happened. We had a villain that was, whose motivations were questionable, as far as, you know, what actually was the motivation. Um, and then not really much sense of resolution. Like, yeah, they got the planets back and he's in some weird dimension, which I guess is a typical Ratchet and Clank ending. But, yeah. But for a, a comic, I just, it's just not there. And I'm trying to decide because three out of five sounds good because it's sort of a middle of the road, like, there there are a lot of good things about it like the art well, was that's, good and the story was interesting but at the i think point, it's i think it's just my i think my three out of five is just like it was competent yeah it, it wasn't it wasn't like and and i don't know what your like mental reasoning is for you know your ratings or how you how you sort of like think through that but that that to me is like this is like the definition of a three for me um 
where it's like it was fine they didn't make any like huge missteps they executed it fine but they didn't do anything that stood out and it didn't really do anything to make it feel unique um right as a comic book it just they they just could have done more with it whereas um and I, i mean the reason i'm rating this lower than a four the reason i'm giving it a three as well is because thinking back to mega man that story left us going wow they actually hit on some really cool ideas here we would like to see those fleshed out so it gave me that sense of like i want to read more whereas with this i felt like eh, okay that was fine and it's like like if i had the book i would throw it on the shelf and i'd probably never pick it up again you know Mm -hmm. so that i i I don't know i guess i guess that's the difference for me and that's why i had to i had to pull it down to at least a three because i was just like it's we've seen this done really well with another property that arguably has much less story than ratchet and clank so i don't know yeah i no i i agree with you a hundred percent like totally but i think at the same time i'm gonna be a little bit more drastic and and, oh and say that if this didn't exist i don't think that anybody would miss it uh yeah i think that's fair to say I, i don't think it adds anything that you need so if a one rating was like total garbage and it was just awful this would not be that because it's still it's still entertaining so it's not it's not garbage whatsoever so don't don't think that at all but just not meeting expectations of either a game story or a comic book story i feel like it's a very low it's not a middle of the road it's it's low for me Uh so i'd be looking more of like a probably a two okay you probably talk me to a 2.5 but yeah, that makes sense. I think, I'll I, I think out of five bananas. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. I may have given it, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I may have given it an extra point just because I love Ratchet and Clank so much. Yeah. I, I'm there's not that sure. too. But, uh, but it's, it's hard to separate myself from that, but I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I think that, I think that makes a lot of sense. So yeah, Joe gives it a, a two out of five. I give it a three out of five. Hmm. Miss Gears may be in league with Dr. Nefarious. Yeah, who knew? She always seems so sweet and innocent in her videos. Well, except for that one with the... You know what the... <clears throat> She might possess information about what Nefarious is planning. I think it would be very interesting if anybody who's never played a Ratchet and Clank game could read this and give us your perspective. I would be really interested to know because Mike and I are both completely 100% bias because we've played all the games and while we might not remember them super super well because it's been a lot of years we at least you know things jog our memory or we can do the research and find out but if you've never played ratchet and clank please find a way whatever way that you feel comfortable (laughs) to read this and connect with us on social media and let us know what you think because i would be very interested to know yeah yeah that that actually would be a really good perspective to get um if, yeah, so if anybody can find this on, if it's on Comixology or, you know, wherever else you can read digital comics, maybe give it a shot just for that kind of thought experiment, because it would be really interesting to talk about, were you able to follow it? Did did the character beats land? You know, those kind of things. So, yeah. All right. Well, Joe, what are we going to be working on next time? Well, Michael, next time on We Like Comics Because They Have No Bones, we will be having a timely review of Star Trek Generations, which will coincide with the release of the Star Trek Picard show on March 3rd. And just a little bit of a tagline for that next episode here to get you guys excited about it. The Star Trek Generations comic includes many, many deleted scenes that were filmed, but you know, left on the cutting room floor for the movie Star Trek Generations. So it's going to be a really interesting discussion of us being able to look at the comic and go, oh, was this additive to the experience? Does this, you know, how does this line up to the movie? So, and also Guinan is featured very prominently in that movie. Uh, That's probably the most screen time she gets in anything. And she's going to be in the new season of Picard. So uh, I think that helped us land on what we were going to review next. So... 
Yeah, and don't forget to tune in to our after show. If you're listening to us on YouTube, you can just click the link and go right to our after show. If you're listening on a podcast platform, the address is tinyurl.com slash bonelesscomicspodcast, which will take you to our YouTube channel for the after show. That's right. Stay boneless, everybody. We like Co- comics because they have no phone. <laughs> Enterprises is not responsible for sprains, broken bones, snapped tendons, bruised egos, or accidental death incurred while taking the challenge.